Hi, this is Emerald and welcome to the Diamond Net and today I'm going to be talking to you about intergenerational trauma. Alright, so in this video I'm going to be talking to you about intergenerational trauma. Now, basically intergenerational trauma in the simplest terms is just basically it's trauma that gets passed down through generations. So it's basically like the parents maybe go through a trauma and they pass it down to the kids who pass it down to their kids who pass it down to their kids and so on. Um, and so basically with intergenerational trauma, you know, it can be something like let's say an example would be let's say there is a famine that impacts a particular community uh, 150 years ago and basically you know the people in that community are dealing with this trauma around scarcity and you know all sorts of different things come about because of that scarcity and then basically let's say the kids and you know maybe experience some kind of uh, let's say after effect from that you know where let's say the parents are maybe uh, really really orienting to things from a place of scarcity and then the kids pass that on to their grandkids and so on and so on and so on and then we end up with somebody who is a descendant of let's say the people who lived 150 years ago in that community and that person is dealing with feelings of scarcity around love or opportunities or you know things like this and so this person might never have gone with food you know like you know, might never have gone without food for a single day in their life but might be experiencing scarcity in other ways because of that pattern that was set up you know so many generations ago relative to scarcity and there are many different ideas about how intergenerational trauma gets passed from, uh, from let's say parent to child and so on and so on. So one way the thought is that there's some kind of epigenetic changes that happen in the DNA, you know, relative to experiencing certain traumas and that maybe that, you know, that alteration in the DNA, you know, gets passed on to kids. So there's that idea. Then there's the idea of like, let's just say direct folkways uh, being internalized, you know, so it could could be something like let's say if uh, my grandmother she went through like the Great Depression and so it's like if she was dealing with scarcity and then maybe she raised my mom in a way where let's say my mom maybe was like extra uh, frugal about things and then maybe I picked up on that um, that's not like accurate to how it's happened you know in my personal life but that could be an example of how let's say intergenerational trauma gets kind of picked up through folkways and then one that let's say I could at least attest to in relation to my own experiences is more of a subconscious kind of like passing you know certain traumas on to the next generation you know so where it's like let's say if um, I have someone back in my ancestry that was dealing with some kind of trauma or some kind of uh, let's say psychological issue that they didn't ever face with or work through and they pass it on to their kids and they pass it on to their kids and basically because nobody has worked through this um, this uh, issue in the unconscious it just keeps getting passed on from generation to generation to generation um, and not even necessarily because of the way the parents are treating the children it's just kind of almost like passes like through some kind of psychological osmosis um, and so this is the one that I can attest to in my own experiences so Basically, um, it, this was a couple of years ago. So every spring I participate in a plant medicine retreat. And so I have like a ceremony and I go on a, a journey and I, I get a lot of different insights uh, about my personal experiences, my personal life. And I get lots of just insights in general. And in one of the experiences that I was having, um, it's basically I was experiencing a lot of fear. Um, so one of the things that I had become aware of prior to this journey is that I hold a lot of fear and terror like in my throat in my jaw in my shoulders like basically my nervous system is kind of just held on to this emotion um, and I can kind of link it back to certain experiences that I've had in my life but I'm also believing that maybe it is something that just has gotten passed from generation to generation and so basically what I experienced was that like when I would close my eyes, I would be able to see the fear that was like, you know, that was residing there in these parts of my body. And basically when I would focus on each of these like shapes of fear, like I was able to like process through them. And so I was seeing in my mind's eye, you know, that like basically all of these different shapes were coming up and the fear was basically like this tension. And it was a tension that I was like previously unwilling 
willing to face with because I had been making my fear into something that was so much scarier. But when I was able to flatten the illusion and just see that the fear was just tension, I was able to sit with those feelings that were arising. And after processing through like, you know, 20 or 30 shapes of fear, it clicked me into this awareness of this childhood aspect of myself that I had not been in touch with in a very, very long time. And so the way that I would describe the experience is that I was in like this big vein or this big root system. And so it's like, it occurs to me, it occurred to me afterward that this could be kind of symbolic of like some kind of generational trauma or generational root system, you know, the idea of like the family tree or that type of thing. But I was in like this reddish brown like root or vein system and I was there all alone um, and it was quite dark um, and I was three years old and I was just like sitting there and like staring up at like the the ceiling of this root system which wasn't very far above my um a very wasn't very far above my head so it was a very claustrophobic kind of feeling and I had this sense of like absolute terror and this sense like I have to be perfect to be lovable and I have to do all the scary things alone. And the way that I would describe it is like if you could imagine there was like a three year old that like got lost in the woods and they had to totally take care of themselves and they had to, you know, basically help themselves survive through the situation. And it was the idea if they even made one mistake that they weren't going to make it. And basically there was this like awareness that came up to me of like, oh, it's like I'm trying to be perfect in my mother's eyes, you know, and it was this sense of I have to match up to her expectations. And it was like almost being superimposed onto this situation. And it brought me back into this memory from when I was three years old. It wasn't a repressed memory or anything. I actually had really clear memories of this from when I was a kid. Um, basically when I was three years old, I went underneath the bathroom cabinet and I got my mom's makeup bag out. And I always like, uh, my mom was always one to like wear makeup and wear really nice clothes. And she liked to like, you know, go shopping at thrift stores and get like nice things. And so I always like looked up to my mom like a lot when I was like a kid. And I was always like kind of trying to dress like her, be like her. And one of the things that is uh, an important note here is that I look almost nothing like my mom and I look everything like my dad. Um, and this is something that I didn't really think of as like being an issue once I got past a certain age, but I guess it was a hang up of mine when I was a kid and I didn't remember this before, but it brought me back into this memory of going up underneath the bathroom cabinet and like grabbing out that makeup pouch. And I took out her red lipstick and I started to like smear it like all over my face. And it's like, it's something I remember doing. And it's also something that my family would tell as like a cute story. It's like, oh yeah, Emerald went underneath the, the, the cabinet and got the lipstick out. And, but what was interesting is in going back into that memory, uh, it came clear to me that there was an intention there that I had forgotten about. I was trying to look like my mom. And to me at the time, my mom was the standard of perfection. Like I saw her almost in like a God-like sense as like being the most perfect human being. And I was like trying to match up to this perfection that I perceived in her. And the fact that I didn't look like her was like, I guess a huge, um, you know, anxiety provoking thing for me. It was like, no, I don't wanna be on team dad, I wanna be on team mom. And so it was like this sense of allegiance and like I had to be perfect in order to ally myself with her and to feel like I was going to get support and things like that. And so basically there was this almost like this, what came through in that experience, there was like this idolization of my mom and like trying to match up to standards of perfection, which I perceived to be based off of her, you know, so that which was perfect was like her. And when I came into that recognition, it brought me back into the awareness of that root system and this sense of like this burden of like matching up to this standard of perfection that my mom represented. And then what there was this awareness of was to my left and I didn't like I was still alone in the root system, but I could sense somewhere up in the ceiling area of this root system, my mom was there and her energy was there. And then off to the side, I could sense that my daughter was there. Um, and it was like, we were all dealing with that same issue, that, that sense of, I have to be perfect to be lovable and I have to do all the scary things alone. 
And basically there was like this sense that, and I could see the behaviors in my mom and I could see the behaviors in myself and I could see the behaviors in my daughter that are all relating to that. We all orient to that same generational trauma in different ways. Like, so my whole thing about perfectionism is like, it's almost like I question things to death. I like have to dig down into like the center of the universe to, to find the truth of things. And I feel like I always have to be right about things or do things perfectly. And then my daughter has a version of this where it's like, you know, she won't guess at anything. Like, so it's like, if she's 90% sure or 95% sure about an answer, like let's say on a test or something, or even if you ask her just a random question, it's like, she won't answer it because she does not want to be wrong. And even when she was like, but well, she's 12 now, but back when she was like two, three years old, she would insist that she knew everything that there was to know. And if let's say she made a mistake or somebody else made a mistake, like if they misspoke a word, she would get really, really upset. And my mom also has her own versions of this as well. Um, but it was just really, really clear in, in that moment that we were all dealing with the same trauma and you know that it had been kind of passed on unconsciously between us of like, you know, maybe for it's a possibility and I'm not sure if this is true. Maybe my mom idolized her mom in the same way when she was little. And I know that, you know, for me, it was like this sense of like idolizing my mom up until I hit like seven, eight years old when there was kind of a pendulum swing in the other direction. And then my daughter, one of the things that was very interesting is my daughter is like, I don't look like my mom. My daughter looks exactly like me. Like she's like my clone and everybody's always said it. <laughs> like, and so it's like when she was little, she would insist that her name was not what it is, you know, her name's Sapphire. She would insist that her name is not Sapphire, but that her name is Mini Mama. And so she's got this whole thing, I think, of like her perfectionism coming from like, let's say maybe putting me on a pedestal in the same way that I put my mom on a pedestal and maybe going back, sort of the same thing. And so basically there is like this generational trauma that has like moved, let's say in a way unconsciously, you know, from my mom to me and from me to my daughter. Um, and there were many things that I decided to do very, very different from the way that my mom raised me. And I, you know, because I could see that, oh, it's like, I don't want this to, to come about for my daughter. And despite the fact that I had compensated in that way, those same patterns still got passed on, you know, so still dealing with like, let's say lots of shame, you know, lots of perfectionism, lots of these types of issues. And so this is like my experience of my own intergenerational traumas. And what I'm imagining is that if I would have explored that root system more deeply is that I could have potentially gone back to the origin point of where this like trauma came from of that feeling of having to be perfect to be lovable and the shame around that and then the feeling of having to do all the scary things alone the aftermath of that journey i was really really sad like i could only cry because i thought oh i was trying to like keep my daughter from experiencing the same types of traumas as me but because i had not worked through my own traumas you know because that cycle was still going it still got passed down and the way that i would put it is, is that it's almost like a particular shadow aspect gets passed down through the generations so what I would say is that you know when it comes to shadow aspects these are parts of ourself that we fragment off and we put in the shadow um, and so they function as their own little mini personalities that behave autonomously from the conscious personality and so what I can see you know with this experience is that my mom me and my daughter all have the same repressed shadow aspect in ourselves and basically the experience of going into those memories and facing with this terrified three-year-old and me was probably the only time that this aspect has been like faced with like directly and so if I were to actually try to break this cycle I would actually have to go in and work directly with that shadow aspect and integrate that um, and basically at that point it would change you know the the patterns of intergenerational trauma that come through my family line and it would probably create kind of a healing sense since I'm still in the um, I'm, I'm still in you know the the raising my daughter phase you know so I still have like a handful of years to kind of course correct with some things and basically with this aspect of myself that's been repressed a big part of it is you know 
being aware of it, being in touch with it, being willing to feel its feelings of fear, you know, being willing to, let's say, reach out and accept help, being able to um, have a little bit more mercy on myself when I like make mistakes, you know, being able to model, let's say, a kind of, you know, no worries, you know, around mistakes, you know, that sort of thing. And basically though, it's like whenever these shadow aspects get passed down, you know, a very important thing is to be able to do the shadow work and to face directly with these aspects that have been made unconscious because we end up like passing them on to our children or perhaps even maybe other people who've spent enough time around us also start to pick up on these same kinds of patterns as well. Now there's a quote from Swiss psychologist Carl Jung that goes something like, if you fail to make the unconscious conscious, you'll, experiencing it, uh, you'll experience it over and over again and you'll call it fate. And so basically with this quote, um, what I would say is that a lot of the patterns that have arisen in my own life mirror this deep sense of, oh, I have to be perfect to be lovable and I have to do all the scary things alone. I notice that I tend to run into situations where maybe I don't have anybody to call out to for help or maybe I don't like, let's say, feel comfortable calling out to help for somebody or, or support or, you know, dealing with situations that are very, very high stakes where, you know, basically making a mistake, you know, can cause like, you know, bigger issues and things like that. And I can notice that, you know, the same could be said in my daughter's life at the very least, that there are some like high stakes type of things. And so when it comes to the patterns that come about in our life, oftentimes because of our familial patterns, our intergenerational patterns, we will be attracted to partners that complement and mirror that kind of internal shadow dynamic, the kind of internal drama of the intergenerational trauma, or we'll be attracted to friendships and opportunities and jobs that might mirror that as well. And so maybe it's like, you know, if I don't, uh, let's say, deal with this or something like that, you know, it would be something like manifesting situations where um, it's like everything's kind of on the, the blade of a knife and it's got to make sure everything is exactly right. Um, so basically with this, you know, we can end up, let's say, manifesting certain patterns in our life that are unsatisfactory based off of these generational traumas and based off of, let's say, the shadow aspects that we repress as a result. And oftentimes what will happen is that our shadow aspects will try to bring us more and more into connection with them. So for me, because terror was a huge part, you know, is a huge part of my generational trauma, you know, I line up maybe with more situations that aren't going to make me feel a sense of fear so that I actually have to face with those parts of myself. And so if we find ourselves manifesting the same types of things over and over again that are stressful, that are, uh, let's say, you know, just not what it is that we want, oftentimes we want to look at our individuation, our individual and our generational traumas to, to see if there's anything that needs to be addressed in order to, let's say, get out of certain grooves or get out of certain holding patterns. Now, when it comes to breaking the cycles that come about as a result of intergenerational trauma, a lot of times people will go into this uh, tendency to go, okay, look, okay, my parents raised me this way and I'm going to raise my kids a totally different way so that I don't, you know, so that they don't experience the same trauma that I experienced. And in a sense, this will help in some ways, you know, so you could probably like, let's say if you were raised by a parent or someone were raised raised by a parent that was like, you know, very abusive, you know, deciding not to abuse your kid the same way, you know, is certainly going to, you know, break that cycle in some ways and, you know, benefit the child in some ways. But even if we compensate like that, or even if we decide to go in a totally different direction, it doesn't necessarily mean that the generational cycle is going to break if the same patterns that like, let's say led to, let's say the, the situation of the parents being abusive, if the underlying dynamics aren't addressed within let's say the parent of the child then that might very well go on to the child you know so if I take this example of like let's say the parent was abusive to uh, let's say the let, let's say we have grandparents parents and then we have the children so let's say the grandparents were abusive to the parents 
and then the parent goes, oh, I'm going to be a totally different way and I'm going to treat my children kindly. You know, if let's say the thing that was creating the abusive behavior was something like powerlessness or something like that, and then basically they passed on that feeling of powerlessness to their child, and then, you know, maybe it, it, that powerlessness comes through in some other different kind of way. Like, you know, maybe the, the parent to the child, you know, isn't going to be abusive the same way that their parents were to them, but maybe they make their child feel powerless in some other way that's not on their radar. Maybe they, they are, let's say, taking away the agency of their child. Maybe they're trying to be so involved in their child's life or such good parents that they take away the agency from their child and the child uh, then inherits that same sense of powerlessness. So oftentimes, you know, and you know, when it comes to let's say kind of easier patterns to break where we go, okay, my parents did this, I don't want to do that as well. That's one part of breaking the cycle, but you also have to, let's say, break the cycle from a more emotional psychological level as well, where if let's say it's the case that shame gets passed down, you have to break the cycle of shame, or if it's the cycle of powerlessness that gets uh, passed down, you have to break that, or if there's a cycle of loss that gets passed down, you have to break that cycle. So you want to be looking looking toward, let's say, what the underlying pattern actually is. So I could say that a lot of the manifestations in my mom's behavior, my behavior, my daughter's behavior, all of those really link back down to feelings of shame and disconnection. And so really the generational patterns that have to be shifted have to do with shame and disconnection. Now, if there was something that my mom was doing where I could be like, oh no, I'm not going to do this, right? And then I raise my child a different way. And of course, I think every parent makes those kind of decisions when it comes to their parents' decisions. You know, that doesn't guarantee that that cycle will break. If I'm still dealing with shame, if I'm still dealing with feelings of disconnection, I'm going to pass that on to my children, even if I am parenting my children in a totally different way from how my parents parented me. And so what's very important when it comes to breaking these cycles is to become aware of what cycle that you're actually breaking. So you want to look at like, you know, uh, below the symptom level of what's actually coming up and you have to see what the deeper core thing is, you know. So I would say that, you know, the, through the different manifestations of how, let's say, this like trauma around shame and, and terror and feelings of disconnection, that sense of having to do all the perfect thing, you know, do things perfect and do all the scary things alone, all of those are the deeper level. But on the surface, maybe it's the case that it comes through in a sense of like, you know, holding myself to really high standards or holding others to me in really high standards. It's like, well, you might think, okay, well, then I'm just going to go to the next generation and I'm not going to hold my kids to as high of a standard and I'm going to be more relaxed. But that doesn't necessarily break it unless you know what the deeper root of the generational trauma is. At that point, that's when you can break it, which is, you know, in, in my case here, it would be being able to make myself and my daughter feel like, you know, like we don't have to be alone, we don't have to be perfect, you know, everything is gonna be okay, to be able to accept imperfections in ourselves, like this sort of thing. And so that would be my recommendation for how to break those cycles is to get aware of what the actual cycle is, you know, and that tends to happen underneath the level of behavior. So basically you can have totally opposite behaviors that are coming from the same generational trauma wound. So let's say that somebody's dealing with uh, generational shame. Well, some people might deal with that generational shame by you know, trying to make themselves invisible and to try to blend in. And other people might try to deal with that shame by trying to become the center of attention. So you can get totally opposite manifestations from the deeper cycle. So you have to be aware of what that deeper cycle is be uh, underneath any other type of apparent problem. So it's like, for example, um, in the case of like, let's say there's a parent that expects too much of their child. It's like, okay, that's sort of the outward manifestation of that. But the underlying thing is like whatever reason that that behavior is manifesting. And so just changing the upward behavior isn't necessarily going to switch things up unless you deal with the root cause. And then once you realize what the deeper root cause is of the generational uh, trauma cycle, you know, um, you have to give yourself what is the opposite. So uh, for example, 
example for mine, which is having to do with shame and which is having to do with feeling like I have to be perfect to be lovable and having to do all the scary things alone. Some ways that I could start to, let's say, reverse that cycle or break that cycle is by, you know, let's say being kinder to myself, accepting myself when I make mistakes or being able to, let's say, reach out to others when I need help. Um, being able to speak out when I feel a sense of terror or fear and to be able to uh, be okay with like let's say uh, feeling okay with you know bringing people into my uh, my own world my own inner world when I'm feeling those feelings all of these things are things that you know start to break those generational cycles so if you think about a generational cycle as like a holding pattern you know almost like a whirlpool what you can do is you can start to like put things you know almost like just choose to do things in the opposite direction and that tends to change the trajectory of how let's say the, the water is spinning within the metaphor and and so basically being able to be aware of what the underlying cause of the generational trauma is and what the, the, the trauma cycle actually is underneath, let's say all the expressions, and then being able to make changes to those generational patterns become aware of what your intergenerational trauma is, what you want to do is you want to take a good look at your family members. You want to look at, let's say, your parents, you want to look at your children, you want to look at like any siblings, you want to look at any extended family members. And you can start to, you know, see maybe certain patterns of behavior and, and things like this. Now, when it comes to, um, let's say, somebody who was adopted or something like that, where they don't have direct connection to their blood relatives, they'll want to look at their adoptive family also to see if there are any patterns that kind of come through from the adoptive family. Um, or, you know, they want to maybe try to tune in to whatever kind of patterns are happening within them. So ultimately, when we experience generational trauma, you know, within ourselves, we oftentimes just experience it as our own you know and so it can be the case that you know without any kind of awareness of what our familial background is we can still interface with our own trauma and it could be the case that we're carrying fears that are not our own or going through patterns that are, are not you know don't originate with us and that sort of thing but we can still operate from the perspective of let's say healing our trauma as an individual if uh, you know and actually healing that generational trauma even if we are not in connection with our family of origin but you want to basically notice the patterns that you're in and then start to see what the root cause of those patterns are and then to try to do the opposite and if you do have connection with people in your family just noticing the different ways that let's say the same pattern manifests in them can give you a lot of insight into like how those um, how those patterns have come up in yourself Anyway, so that's all I have for you for now. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead, click the like button below and subscribe and leave me a comment down below. Also, if you would like to learn about shadow work, I have a free shadow integration masterclass called the six simple steps to shadow integration. Um, and you can go there and, and watch that for free by typing in shadowintegration.org slash masterclass. Anyway, that's all I have for you for now. And until next time, keep becoming more you. Mm -hmm.